That's the last thing I remember. And then all of a sudden I wake up a few days later in the hospital. And I had a pneumonia and a lung infection, a bunch of crazy stuff. But surviving that, everything I had done before, yeah, it was a lot of selfish stuff. But now I was a father to an 18 month old daughter who I nearly left fatherless from not even two years of age onward. For the, she would have grown up without her biological father her whole entire life because of my inability to regulate my behavior when it came to substances. There was several years where I didn't spend enough time sober to even really, I mean, really I'm talking, I was drinking almost every night for several years. I would do that maybe two nights and then I'd, and then I'd take a night off and then, uh, you know, so, so I, it was just, but that, and that whole time, I don't even know, I can't tell you how I felt even at that time, aside from just feeling bad, because it was just, it, it happened, it, it feels like it all happened so fast and it was just such a blur. Thanks for tuning in to the Elevation Recovery Podcast, your hub for addiction recovery strategies, hosted by Chris Scott and Matt Finch. When you were talking about binging, yeah. The vendors, it was because that was my same exact experience. I used to be, well, I'm still a musician, but I used to play in bands in my 20s up until early 30s. And I remember playing shows and having stage fright, social anxiety, stage fright. I'd pop some Norcos or some Oxycontin and down it with a bunch of beers or mixed drinks. And then I would go play so good. And I just loved being around people and being right. high and being euphoric and having these great conversations and having these great experiences and these close friends doing these awesome things with. Yeah. And, you know, being in 20s and early 30s, that was kind of cool. But then I had a daughter and that started to get not cool anymore. It's like you can't keep doing that stuff. And so a lot of clients and a lot of people that comment, they're of the binge drinking variety. So, you know, so there's people that are physiologically dependent on alcohol. They yeah. will, they need it every day or they go through withdrawal. But the binge drinking variety was what I used to be most of the time. I was physiologically dependent twice, but all the rest of the years I would be mostly not drinking, but then I would drink and I'd go on fucking benders of like three days or three months and uh, so we should just talk about that music, benders, and how people can start to get out of that cycle because that's really scary when you could just be fine for a few months or a few weeks and then you, you drink all of a sudden. Maybe let's say, okay, I don't want to drink at all, but then you find yourself at a bar or watching a show or something, and maybe you're like on a date with a girl and everyone else is drinking and it's it's almost like in those periods or something stressful happens in life and your girlfriend leaves you some people despite not wanting to drink at all they'll be like boom all of a sudden i was in autopilot mode going to the store or going to the bar to get alcohol knowing like i shouldn't be doing this but there's no controlling it they're just like on a mission and when people don't have uh, the type of behavioral regulation to be in charge of their behaviors when when they could just make such poor decisions that lead to these benders that's a scary place to be and you're not really ever kind of safe and stabilized in life if you have something like that uh, hanging over your head that could just come out at any time you know yeah for sure yeah um i don't know i don't know if i ever I don't know if I can recall a time where I I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to say this. I don't know if there was ever a time where I knew that I was dependent on alcohol physically. Like I think that there were times where I um, would feel really bad for a couple of days at a time, but I didn't know enough about the disease or, or the, the talk, the, you know, the pharmacology of, um, how alcohol was affecting my body or my brain 
you know, I, I, I understood the concept of a hangover, but you know, <laughs> I, um, the, the cold sweats or the nightmares, you know, um, but there was a, you know, there was several years where I didn't spend enough time sober to even really, I mean, really I'm talking, I was drinking almost every night for several years, but, uh, I would do that maybe two nights and then I, and then I'd take a night off and then, uh, you know, so, so I, it was just, but that, and that whole time, I don't even know, I can't tell you how I felt even at that time, aside from just feeling bad, um, because it was just, it, it happened. It, it feels like it all happened so fast and it was just such a blur, you know, like, uh, you know, I was telling Chris in our last, um, podcast that, um, you know, I, I spent like a week in California, a week and a half. And, um, I, I, I remember, I remember coming into California and seeing the mountains and going, wow, that's amazing. And then, and then I remember, um, I remember playing at a place called fat cats in Modesto. And then I remember leaving California. <laughs> like I, I, you know, it was just that whole tour life was a blur, a total blur. I've played thousands of shows and I, and I can really only remember a handful. Wow. It, what's crazy because when I was in my twenties and then early thirties too, I was in bands here or there, never like professionally, always very amateur, very kind of like our hobby. Of course we wanted to make it big, but who are we kidding? We, we didn't have the, those type of skills or those type of songs. But what I did a lot, was I had friends that were in bands like this one band was a local band called Spoken Gun. So I was friends with a lot of people that were in local bands and we'd just go party and watch them all the time, you know, playing at Mother's Saloon, playing at Canes and PB. So I was in that lifestyle. And while it was only a little bit here and there where I was the one playing the shows, I was regularly frequenting the bars where there's bands playing and stuff. And a lot of the times how I would stay alcohol free as I do pharmaceutical pills. I don't want to do alcohol. That shit's going to get me in trouble. So I had this t-shirt, several t-shirts that had these hidden pockets and I'd put Percocet and Xanax, Valium, muscle relaxers, whatever I could get. And so that, that would work. Sometimes I could still have fun. I would do pills and I would drink Red Bull on the rocks at a bar or at a show or something like that. But it yeah. was, it was always just, I was still hanging around, people that were getting wasted, getting drunk as shit. And that was really dangerous. But I wanted to have fun. I wanted to socialize. Um, I didn't want to go to like, it, it, at least where I live, all the people at the AA and NA meetings were, for the most part, way older than me, or they're my same age. But I just never felt like I wanted to hang out with 99.99% of the people, you know, intuitively, I'm like, yeah, no offense, but I don't want what any of these people have. And I don't even want to hang out with almost all these people. It's a, it's, it's definitely strange. I, I started playing, I started playing in bars like right out of high school. So I went from being a kid to never really having like a normal adult life or adult social life. I went straight from high school to partying in bars, which seemed like it was just, it was so fast paced all the time and, and chaotic and just super high highs and low lows, you know? So it, everything else seemed boring. Anything, anything, anything that could be perceived as like sitting at home like that, you know, that type of life where, you know, I, I didn't, I could not conceptualize how my parents could just <laughs> stay sit at home and like watch TV together or things like that stuff that normal people would enjoy that, you know, now, now being 35, I look at it and go, wow, man, like that's, it is nice to be able to just be here, be present and be calm. And like nothing has been going on. I'm just, I'm sitting here, you know, reading a book. Like it's, it's, it's unreal because I just, it's just, it's, it's so fascinating to me how, how uninspired I was to just be like, I always had to be doing something and whatever my present state was, was never good enough. So I had to, I, 
and I didn't realize I, I this is this is something I'm, I'm introspective about now. It certainly wasn't then. I was just I was just flying by the seat of my pants then. But it was just and, and certainly the people you're always around other people that are that are partying. So it's just it's it, those environmental cues, you know, this because that's that's your social norm. That's that's what seems like the right thing to do. And it was just weird. And, and, and actually, just as we were having this conversation, it clicked for me that I'm like, wow, I just I didn't even know back then. I didn't even know what it was like to just be an adult or just to just be calm or to be bored. Like I, what what did, what did that even look like? Because anytime I even started to feel different than I did, which was which was drumming, being drunk or being high or having sex or anything that's anything that was super high pleasure, you know, um, I didn't nothing, nothing. I didn't do any of that stuff because I, I, I honestly think it would terrify me. It, it would terrify me to be bored or to be still for more than a day. <laughs> this is, this is bringing up a bunch of really interesting uh, places I want to take this now because I think a bunch of people are like, oh, yes, I'm. this is feeling like me. I know a bunch of people right now. Uh, recently, they did research. I forget what school they did it out of. It was in America, somewhere in the Midwest, I think. And they did research on rats by feeding them cocaine. Mm. And there was two groups. Um, what they found was that through there's this trait called they've named it the high sensation seeking trait basically there are rats and humans too that are genetically pre innately wired to uh, when you have this trait you will do more you'll you'll do more effort you'll put in more time and you'll take greater risks to get a hot some type of a high sensation so you know this is like all of my 20s and early 30s it's like downhill skateboarding surfing big wave surfing uh, promiscuity with all sorts of girls and unprotected sex and you know j snorting drugs and trying different drugs and drug combinations all to feel this high you know yeah. yes i was self-medicating generalized anxiety and social anxiety but beyond that self-medication i wanted to feel high and euphoric just like what you were talking about uh when chris interviewed you i wanted to f and then i hated when the bars were closing or when the party was ending yeah seemed yeah. like so many yeah right so many other people were able to just like okay well, i'm gonna go home and go. but i didn't want it to no let's keep oh. this going let's yeah. you know and come to well, find out many we're going later. to somebody's house we're going to somebody's mm -hmm. house and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna you know, chop up a ball and and pass the plate around. We're gonna have amazing conversations, and fire, you know, brains, brains firing all cylinders, and we got music playing in the background. Like it, I I I I lived for those nights, and anything else, anything else other than that seemed below me. Like it it you know just because anything else seemed mundane. Because when 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 you experience. I mean, and, and, and again, not even not even considering the, the neurobiological effects, the pharmacological effects that these drugs have on the brain, because if we're talking about like just just the baseline of dopamine, like, you know, it, OK, so like if, if you're if your brain is supposed to sit at, let's say, 50, I think it's 50 nanograms per deciliter. That's a, you know, the unit, unit measurement for dopamine. That would be that would be normal. The normal amount for the brain that like for you to get up out of bed and make your cup of coffee in the morning and get your day started. That's the, that's the amount of motivation amount of dopamine that you would need for that to happen. Right. For you to, for, you know, let's say, let's say on your on, on a, that's a good day. That's a normal day on a, on a bad day for a normal person. Your the, 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 your chemical level would sit around 40 nanograms per deciliter. Right. And that's like that you're, you're at this point, you're going, fuck work. I am calling off today. I'm not getting out of bed. Uh, just I'm just not I'm not peopling today. Right. And uh, that's a bad day. So like so let's go to the other end of the spectrum on your best day. Like, you know, you're you, you won the lottery um, and, you know, you're 
you just got hit up on Instagram by a supermodel and, you know, <laughs> and everything coming together. Right. So you're at 100 nanograms per deciliter, like nothing, nothing could go wrong. Right. And that's 100 nanograms per deciliter. Like that's that's where our brain is supposed to cap out like, OK, like that's <laughs> euphoric. Right. So introduce introduce a stimulant like cocaine or methamphetamine or or an opiate like heroin. And now we're we're we are going way past 100 nanograms per deciliter. Like statistically, I think the first time somebody does methamphetamine, it's somewhere up around 1,100 nanograms per deciliter of dopamine in the brain. Like anything you had in reserve is gone. So how? So if I if I take that knowledge that I have now, that information that I have now, and I look at what I was experiencing then, like how could there be anything better? Then snorting some blow to the face, having a bunch of, you know, Jameson or Jägermeister, or whatever I was chose to drink that day, you know, and, you know, popping a pill or whatever, because there's nothing else. Literally, there's nothing else on this planet at that point that can give me that type of chemical reaction in my brain, that kind of bliss. Right. And I and I started doing that at a very early age, very young age. And I had and I had not experienced much of life at that point. So that's what I knew. So, you know, so any day that I wasn't doing that seemed gray and dark and boring and blah. I know that was a lot of information right <laughs> right off the rip, but I just I just wanted to put it in perspective. If like if we look at this from a, a, a neurobiological standpoint, you know, it's like and then and translate that to physical experience. Right. There's nothing that that there's nothing normal there's nothing safe or environmental natural that you get that kind of high from mm -hmm. you know because we're not we're not we're not designed to feel that so 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 when so when we introduce these types of chemicals to our brain we're, it's like how how are we supposed to how are we supposed to re-regulate you know it's certainly not an overnight process mm -hmm. you know and it takes and it takes it takes going through so much of those miserable feelings, what we, what we describe as acute withdrawal and post acute withdrawal syndrome, you know, for the brain to re-regulate itself. And it's not like we ever forget. I, I vividly remember the bliss that I feel from alcohol and cocaine. Like I, I vividly remember that. And, and there's not anything on this planet that I can say um, will give me that kind of feeling. I've gotten to the place, I've gotten to the place at this point where I've accepted that um, that that is the case and that and that I'm at peace with the things that give me good feelings and um, happiness and joy in a natural state thing, you know, things like working out. I, you know, that's that is my that is my drug of choice at this point, you know, mm -hmm. reading really good books. I've been been reading Ego is the Enemy. Um, I for, love Ryan Holiday. Good oh choice. That's a good book. Uh, all you read uh, Obstacles the Way yet? I, I listened to it on Audible. Me too. <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I I do a mixture, and I and I'm and I've I've also I've also been completing his Daily Stoic Journal. So that's oh, been, nice! That's I don't have fun. that. That's a, yeah, a prompted it, journal. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, so yeah. It's, so if you if you if so if you have the Daily Stoic, or you can listen to his podcast because he, mm -hmm. he does an entry from the Daily Stoic every day. But it's yeah, it's a prompted journal. So it, you know, and I start. I just started not too long ago, so I have a lot of empty spots. But you know, it just asks you like a question. Like April twenty fourth was nice cars, jewels, fine wine. What are these <laughs> things really? And that's you know, what's your morning reflection on? I I really enjoy this stuff, and I get and I and it, and it is it is a high for me. It's a high for me to to grow myself, to develop myself. With that being said. It's it's not like I can say apples and oranges with getting high or, you know, living the best quality of life I can. Um, but I think I think what I'm trying to say, I guess, is that I have accepted that um, for me to continue to live and be the best version of myself. I had to say goodbye to being able to experience anything of that magnitude that drugs or alcohol was able to provide for me. That makes I'm sense. Glad. It, it does. It makes a lot of sense. And I'm loving where this is going. I just knew that all I needed to do was start talking with you about 
how I connected with you on that feeling of just euphoria, not wanting it to end, and just everyone else was able to go home, it seemed. But I'm like, no, I don't want to. I have like this fear of it. Um, and then you start talking about the dopamine part. I think I was probably, it was probably eight and a half or nine years ago where this new DVD, it was a DVD back then called Pleasure Unwoven came out by Dr. Yeah. Kevin McCauley. Yeah, you've probably seen it. It's like, I, I they feel, started showing the, <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, you saw it at treatment. Yeah. It's funny, yeah. I watched that in school to be a counselor towards the end of it, I think. And then at the methadone clinic I first started working at, um, they had it on in the waiting room all the time where people were coming in to dose, but waiting in line to see, uh, to get intakes, to, do, to like join the program. So it was on a lot. And I have showed that to so many of the methadone patients and suboxone patients back in the day. I love a lot of the stuff he talks about. Probably the main, one of the main things I took away from that was the dopamine pleasure set point. And, you know, pleasure, the feeling of pleasure is kind of seen as like this thing that's, oh, pleasure. Like, it, like there's a stigma against people that just all like pleasure, but pleasure is one of our senses, smelling, hearing, tasting, seeing, touching, intuiting pleasures, a sense too. And we're wired to seek out things like, you know, high salt and sugar and procreation, have sex to, you know, that's how we're wired to get types of pleasure. But what you're talking about is when you were very young, went right into it after high school, started drinking and drugging and playing concerts, women. So all of a sudden, our brains do have these endogenous neuropharmacies. We create our own endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, GABA, acetylcholine, all those. Um, and for the precise amounts that we're designed to handle typically. Yeah. But then when we start drinking or methamphetamines, holy moly, now we get dopamine way more than anything probably in nature could ever do. Right. At least when it comes to methamphetamines, I think you were talking about that was like a 2,000% or more increase in dopamine. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, the, the more we do that, the brain with neuroplasticity and wiring and everything, the more we do that, say, for instance, genetically at the age of 18 or something, you are easily feeling pleasure. Oh, man, I'm so easily amused. It's fun, fun, fun. Let's just say for this example. Well, then after years and years and years of high sensation seeking alcohol usage and drugs and all the other things you were talking about, now all of a sudden a job from, so that was your dopamine set point before, say for instance, drugs, alcohol, and all the other crazy stuff you're doing brought your dopamine set point, let's say way up here. Right. And now when, whenever on the days you're not doing that stuff, if you get a job promotion here, does it yeah, doesn't you have a job, you know, right. Even like you were saying the Instagram model thing, if your dopamine right. suffering is here, if you're really feeling you're not on any substances that particular day, right. even that it might not even get the dopamine high enough. Absolutely. Unless you have sex with her. <laughs> if you have right. sex with her, uh, then you're probably going to get a pretty high dopamine, but still not as high as if you've been doing methamphetamine. Right. Well, and that, you know, so, Sure, because the brain the brain is exactly what you're saying, and I don't mean to cut you off there. It's like, yeah, the, we're our brain's constantly looking for that homeostasis, right? So it's in it's in constant search of balance of homeostasis. So if you're introducing 1,100 nanograms per deciliter of dopamine on a regular, you know, or, or you know the amphetamines are doing that, your your brain is going to go okay pretty quickly, actually, especially with stimulants, we tend to, we tend to be very, uh, we get, we get a build a tolerance for stimulants. I mean, caffeine's a really good indicator of that. I mean, it's, we get build a very, very quick caffeine tolerance or any other stimulant nicotine, same way. So, um, but your brain goes in a very short amount of time, it goes, Oh, so, Oh, this is normal. Now this is just where we're at. And so anything, so when it drops below that, that, that'd be like your worst day. That's the day you're calling off work, you know? So, and it actually drops way below 40 down to like five, you know, five nanograms per deciliter. Your, your, your brain is saying, if we don't do something mm -hmm. now, we're going to die. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what your brain, that's what the brain is trying to, is trying to tell you. It's like, 
the, I mean, the, if, if we think of some of the, the, the deplorable things that people do to pursue their substance of abuse, right? I mean, they sell their bodies or they, they rob people, they, they, they steal, um, whatever the case it's, you know, it, it's, it puts, it puts it in perspective. If, if that, if that person's brain is, is, is in such a crisis that they really, that it's, it's saying if, if we don't, if we don't get out and get, get whatever we need to make this go away, we're not going to make it, you know? And I, it's, it's, it's horrifying to think about how someone, how someone would feel that bad. I mean, I, there's been plenty of days, especially hungover, you know, the, the, the two, three day hangovers of just mental anguish, not, not even physical, you know, but just the, I mean, some of it's physical, obviously you all of your gab was gone and your glutamate's way up here. So your body's in panic mode and your heart rate's hot way up and your body uh, temperature's up and your anxiety's crazy. But I mean, I mean, I, and I personally never experienced an opiate addiction. So maybe you could enlighten me on that, uh, what those withdrawals feel like. I, I was lucky enough to never really, um, I've always been terrified of needles, which is weird because I have tattoos and piercings. But as far as like medical needles, no bueno. So it's like I never, I never, I never got onto the opiate kick. I was always into um, stimulants, alcohol stimulants, alcohol stimulants. That was my main go to. So, but I can't, I can't imagine what it go, what it's like to go through that type of withdrawal where it's like, I will, I will literally sell my body just so I don't have to feel how I feel right now. Oof. Yeah. I've, I've gone through opioid withdrawal many times from pills and heroin, alcohol withdrawal a few times, a lot of minor times, but uh, the, the severe times a couple times, SSRI withdrawal, nicotine withdrawal, and cannabis withdrawal. I don't think I'm leaving anything out there. Yeah, but anyways, opioid withdrawal, at least for me, was worse than I'd almost rather come off of all those other things I mentioned at once than go through opioid withdrawal again. For whatever reason, that one just, it, it was so hard for me. But the thing with opioids, at least for me, is they were much easier, as hard as the detox was, it was much easier for me to just be like, once I was done detoxing that last time, to just be like, okay, I'm done with this shit. Alcohol, yeah. while the detoxes, the withdrawals for me weren't nearly as bad, nor as long. The opioids, coming, the post-acute withdrawal can be months and months and months for some people, even if they're young and healthy. Sure. But alcohol was by far my most severe addiction. And my longest addiction, it caused me the most amount of harm. I only got arrested once when I was on pills and I got arrested like five or six times on alcohol. That stuff was, that stuff was my enemy. And you were talking about how when your dopamine's that low, you feel like you're going to die. And that reminds me of going back to Kevin McCauley too. That freaking guy is such a genius. You probably might have even seen his some of his YouTube keynotes. He's hilarious in his keynotes. But it was so crazy when he talks about the old experiments in the 1960s where the researchers wanted to find out where addiction happens in the brain. So they were tapping in the prefrontal cortex. Oh, this is our decision-making thing. This is our critical thinking. Tells us what's right and wrong, morals. It's got to be in the prefrontal cortex. So they right. tried to get these mice addicted by putting these rods in their brains all over. Couldn't get them addicted. Couldn't get them addicted. As soon as they stuck it into these two spots in the mice's midbrain, the old survival brain, the unconscious part, then they would get so addicted that they would starve to death. They wouldn't drink their water. They wouldn't eat their food. They would just do coke until they died. And they would even be getting shocked sometimes on the the ground underneath them but it wouldn't stop them from getting cocaine once they injected it into their midbrains and i was like holy moly and then he does this chart where it's on the hierarchy of needs the survival the survival hierarchy of needs uh by maslow on the bottom 
We need food, water, shelter, and then defending from predators. Above that, you know, friends, family, all that. Well, the way he was showing it was that if drugs do hijack your midbrain in the way that can happen with cocaine, with alcohol for many people, for me with opioids, then it's for when I was on opioids, let's say, or alcohol. It was opioids or alcohol, then food, water, and shelter. Yeah. And, and, and at least for me, it was that severe. If, I, if it was the choice between going through withdrawal or buying enough to get me through another couple of days and, and not being able to pay rent, I would do the, avoid the sickness because it was it hijacked my midbrain. So I linked survival itself to the substance. It eroded my prefrontal cortex. So it was like uh, with a hijacked midbrain, it's like the accelerator's on for use. And then yeah. with a disabled eroded prefrontal cortex, your brakes are off. And then what you were talking about with the dopamine, uh, the dopamine pleasure set point being so high, and we're just scratching the surface of all these brain dysfunctions, chronic brain dysfunctions. Right. When people can't feel any sort of pleasure, one thing I learned from quitting opioids was this, Zach. It was that that withdrawal for the post-acute withdrawal, for me and a lot of people, there's two main symptoms that bring us back out for relapse before we're done getting rid of the symptoms. Mm -hmm. Anhedonia, the inability to feel pleasure, pleasure deafness, and the extreme exhaustion. That Those symptoms were largely due to the massive dopamine deficiency. And I often did like Suboxone and Oxycodone, and those are both made uh, with Thebane. Thebane is a natural alkaloid from the opium poppy plant. Then they semi-synthetic synthesize this. Thebane's a stimulant. So a lot of the opioids I did back in the day, they made me energized like I was on Coke, but it was like a more, it was like a mellow yeah. energized. Sometimes it wasn't mellow. Sometimes I'd get hypomanic. But yeah, it's like when, when you look in the big book, oh, alcohol is cunning, baffling, and powerful. Fuck yeah, it is until you start learning about what the substances do to the brain how we already have our own endogenous neuropharmacy. And all these substances are doing is mimicking something that we already have that doesn't come with side effects and that isn't going to saturate our brain with all this toxic levels of stuff. So now you're in the phase where for the past, I think, few years probably, I'm not sure, but I think that's what Chris was telling me. If it's been a few years of doing this and now you're like, I can be mellow. I can relax and read a book. Whereas years ago, that would have been too boring for you. Oh, um, I had I had one part with, with relationships too. My mom, why can't you just, I have so many great girls that you could get with. Because my mom know, knew a lot of cute young girls. They're, they're yeah. teachers. They own a, a herb school, urban nutrition, home-based school that's really popular. All these young, cute, beautiful, like holistic mother earth kind of nurturing women yeah. that were like, all positive and healthy probably would have been great for me. I I was like, didn't matter if I found them physically attracted. I wanted the drama. I wanted the crazy girls. Uh, I don't know why I wanted that. Maybe it was the high sensation seeking. It was like, you know, we had, you and I had both rewired our brains so much that we needed crazy shit going on just to feel, you know, some sort of pleasure and happiness in life. Because we thought that if we stopped partying and stopped doing all that stuff and got like a regular relationship and regular recreational activities, we'd just be bored and depressed. And why, what's the purpose of life? You know, thrive in chaos. We thrive in chaos. We did back then. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't. I I couldn't do boring women. I had to have. I had to have the hottest girl in the bar with the biggest set of problems like it it, it seemed that way and it, and it normally it normally it normally ended with me dating a bartender <laughs> it's, it, it always seemed that way it's it just you, know. and you said you were the drummer too the drummer in your band yeah yeah, yeah. I, i've been the drummer in, in most of the bands i've played in i have a i do a little bit of acoustic now um you know um but uh but yeah that's yeah, so Drum, you got babes. What's that? You got girls back then, bartenders never, and drummers. You know what? That was never. That was never. 
I got I got ninety nine problems, but that that was never one. You know, yep, for sure. <laughs> Uh, one of my things with women, and I've talked about this a little bit on here before, but I was molested at the age of maybe six by my 13-year-old female babysitter at the time. Wow. That that wasn't so bad. You know, that was honestly, that was kind of cool. At least at the time, you know, it might have fucked me up. Probably right. did. It happened again when I was 15. Some guy tried to molest me, but I fucking got out of there. Yeah. So I think from all these weird things with sex and, you know, when you're young, you can't, you don't know how to process that shit. A five, six year old shit, even a 15 year old man, like uh, just really hard to kind of process that stuff. So with, with me, with girls, I was always very afraid of, you know, sexual relations. And I was shy and timid around girls for one, but I also, you know, later on in life, realized that probably a big part of my awkwardness with girls and my fear, not just regarding girls and, you know, getting naked in the bed with them after these weird, crazy, weird, multiple sexual things. when I was younger that were just so not, not cool. But that was another reason that I drank a lot and used pills and did other drugs a lot yeah. was because I wanted to have sex. Here I am in my twenties. I want to be having sex with girls. Mm -hmm. I didn't think that I had the confidence, the self-esteem, the courage, you know, to be able to hit on girls and, you know, get girlfriends and stuff. I'm sure I could have, I could have built those skills, but I was so afraid that I found easy ways to do it. Drink, man, I found out that when I snorted Oxycontins and drank a few beers, I could get almost any girl I wanted no matter how hot because my confidence and my just ability to listen and like empathize and be confident. I wasn't fearful. I wasn't feeling uncomfortable in my own skin. Right. I was feeling like, wow. And I really wanted to get to know this girl, like snorting a bunch of oxys, drinking some beers. I feel great. So I'm talking to girls like just so smooth and they are liking it and, so that that's another reason why it continued to go on so long. Social anxiety for playing music, dating girls and hooking up with girls and just generally just life in general, man. Like I didn't think I was going to live till the age of 30 for a long time. And I tried to commit suicide when I was 24, when I was going through a lot of legal stuff after being raided by the DEA and my girlfriend and I broke up, bunch of crazy shit happened. But what I can tell people listening to this or watching this right now <laughs> is that it takes some work, but let me tell you, you can make your brain and your body and your lifestyle so much different. The way you think, the way you look at everything, the way you feel, your whole beliefs and everything. You can really, really change. So I want people to really know that, I mean, if you're willing to put in some work, you can reverse probably everything and, and not just reverse brain dysfunction from drug and alcohol use. For most of us, we can reverse it, but get your brain and mood feeling better than maybe you ever did in your entire life. That's what it was for me. Yeah. I haven't had social anxiety or generalized anxiety in maybe about two years. And it's like a completely different way to live than the first, you know, three decades, three and a half decades of my life. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, I, I, and I, I, I'm right there with you. I, you know, I'm 35 at this point and, um, my, I feel like I didn't even have an identity. My identity with from 18 to 28, 29, that, that, that identity that I had was entirely superficial and it was founded on um, ego. Just, well, absolutely. Absolutely. Ego. Thank you. So yeah, well said. Um, but, but it, that constant validation, I was, I was constantly looking to be validated. Um, yeah. Even knowing, even knowing realistically by, by any measure, I had not accomplished anything. You know, of any of, of any value, of any value. You know what I mean? 
I, I was, I was a, I was a, I'm an okay drummer. Like, you know, um, but you know, by, by the standards of my small podunk town that I live in, in Ohio, um, you know, and, and everybody that's pissed drunk at the bar, I'm a rock God. God. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know? And so you get told that enough, you know, you, if you get told yeah. that enough, you, you start to believe it, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and man, when, when I, when I, when I finally started connecting the dots and realizing that these drugs were going to fucking kill me, <laughs> like, or, mm-hmm. or, you know, and, and just that I wasn't happy, like this, this wasn't enough, but it was so scary. So, so, so scary to think about what, 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 what will I do then? Because I don't know anybody outside of the bar. Not really. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't have a social circle. I have nobody. Um, other than, other than my family, but you know, uh, it, they, they didn't look at me like these people in the bar did, you know, they didn't, they didn't, you know, I, of course, you know, and my mother, my mother is the sweetest woman and I've always been a rock star to her, you know, and I, and I, and I appreciate that so much, you know, but it's like, I, I, it was really hard for me, very, very hard for me to let go of my ego in that sense because I didn't want to, for one, I didn't want to have to, I didn't want to have to do, which I didn't realize that's not what I wanted to do, but it just seemed like such a big, like staring into the abyss, right. Of, of just like, if I, if I, if I let this go, I I have to start over. Like I have to start completely over and I'm almost 30 and I have to start all the way over. Like, how do I, where do I even start? I didn't have skills. I didn't have independent living skills. I didn't know how to take care of myself. I, 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 but you know, I, I'm, I'm in my mid twenties and I'm still using an electric razor most of the time because <laughs> you know? for one, I was lazy, you know, and I didn't, I didn't, my, my physical appearance really, really didn't matter to me at that point. Um, I was, you know, I was, I was on that Jameson cocaine diet, so I wasn't fat, you know? So it's like, it was, you know, but my eyes were stuck in the back of my head, you know, big dark circles under my eyes, which still, you know, I don't think they'll ever go away to be honest. You know, but it's like, it's, uh, I just didn't, I didn't have any real, I didn't have any real idea of who I was or who I wanted to be. And that terrifies the shit out of me still like thinking back, thinking back on it, that makes me shiver, you know, because it's like, it does for, and and I'm saying this to the people who are listening as well, you know, that man, there's a lot of, you got a lot of work in front of you, especially, especially if you've been, if you've been using substances for a long period of time, because like most people that substance and the things that, you know, the things that are involved in it, which is, um, attaining, using and recovering from that substance and all the people and all the environments, all of that stuff. I mean, it's, it's amazing how over, over years, over, over a long period of time, how ingrained that becomes in our ego and our identity. Um, so to be, to 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 have to face that and, and create and start to create a new one is such a I I'll tell you what people people in recovery are some of the strongest and most courageous people I've ever met in my entire life because it it's you 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 destroy yourself or you destroy yourself and build yourself back up which maybe that's harder maybe that's harder than than having an idea and, 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 and having a nice steady pace through your whole, you know, from, from being a young adult to a middle-aged adult, you know, and, and having, you know, not, not going down that crazy chaos path, you know, and, and you just piece your life together little by little. But, you know, when, when you wake up one day after, a, after a 10 year fucking bender and you realize, holy shit, all I have is a motorcycle to my name. That's all I have. And it doesn't even run. I, you know, I'm sleeping in my girlfriend's house. Like, you know, I, (laughs) like, I I don't have anything. I have nothing to show for all these years of my life. I have an alienated daughter and, and a family who can't trust me for obvious reasons. And, you know, no, no sense of, no sense of work ethic, um, a serious aversion to anything uncomfortable, you know, Uh, (laughs) a low distress tolerance. Oh man, majorly low distress tolerance. Yeah, low distress you know, so, tolerance. 
yeah, it's, I would say, man, I would definitely say people, people that, people that start to dig themselves out or do dig themselves out, I should say, are the strongest people I've ever met. I've ever known. Mm -hmm. I, I do. That, that is one sense. That's one sense of working in, um, in even, even in conventional drug and alcohol recovery, you know, in an outpatient program that I work in, I, I do as, as tiring as that is, because I don't necessarily believe at this point that, um, we're giving them the right tools at the right moment. Um, in, in, in the old school faith-based models, um, you know, uh, at least in my area, I should say, I know, I know out there on the West coast, you guys are a lot more forward thinkers, but uh, <laughs> no, not, not here, not the mainstream <laughs> places, man. In yeah. fact, the place that I worked at for several years, I could probably count on one hand how many people I saw, you know, leave treatment and then would check in every once in a while. I'm still doing good. Most people, we either never heard from again, or they, yep. uh, most of the people would get, come back multiple yep. times. They believe in the comeback. It was like the revolving door. But you said a few things that I want to touch on. Number one was that lack of purpose. That was, that's one of the reasons I wanted to, thought I was going to die by the time I was 30. That's yeah. one of the reasons I didn't care about my health. Cause I'm like, I'm not going to live long anyways. I just want to have as much fun when I'm here and get crazy. And there was something about that lifestyle that attracted me when I was like it did to you. But when I had a near death experience, I overdosed on methadone and Valium. Wow. Two long acting CNS depressants, very powerful ones. And within like two days of taking that, just kept popping them, popping them. I OD'd and I was a minute or two away from being brain dead. Uh, when my mom found me, luckily, she saved my life. And so did the EMTs that got there just in time. Gave me the Narcan, instant withdrawal. But before I went into the instant withdrawal and then was like unconscious in the ambulance, I felt like I was getting abducted by aliens. It was exhilarating. It felt like I was leaving my body and going. Uh, I couldn't see a lot, but it was like I was going down this hallway on a stretcher or something really fast. And I heard them like doing their little alien language. And it felt like we were up way up high in a spaceship or somewhere. That's the last thing I remember. And then all of a sudden I wake up a few days later in the hospital and I had a pneumonia and a lung inf infection, a bunch of crazy stuff, but surviving that everything I had done before. Yeah. It was a lot of selfish stuff, but now I was a father to an 18 month old daughter who I nearly left fatherless from not even two years of age onward for the, she would have grown up without her biological father her whole entire life yeah. because of my inability to regulate my behavior when it came to substances. So waking up, realizing that I was that close to being dead, they said another minute or two, if they would have taken before they gave me the Narcan, I would have been a vegetable brain dead. Yeah. And so that was a wake up call, man. That was a wake up call left the hospital after a week. And then I went through something called post-traumatic growth or post addiction growth. Soon as that happened, man, I just fucking, nothing was stopping me. I felt like this new second chance that God or the universe, the source, whatever you want to call it gave. Yeah. I felt like there was some divine intervention. My mom just happened to get a premonition. Go check on Matthew. She came down there, the ambulance, the EMTs just happened to be able to get there really, really fast that time. They saved my life at the hospital. For all these things like to happen, that's just my belief. I was like, I feel like I've been given a second chance and I'm sure not going to dwindle and squander this life away on this chance. I was like, and I rode that for years, man. For years, I was on this post-traumatic high from growth, recovering from addiction. Um, and just reading and learning, just like you're doing all this stuff right now. You've been reading and learning and you're working in the field and you're just growing your knowledge and your skills and you're curious, asking lots of questions, learning from lots of sources. And I think that's just beautiful, man. I absolutely love that. It's so refreshing uh, to meet someone that is, you, you do a lot of this and you don't have to, you know, 
You don't, you certainly don't have to, you're putting so much time into it. Like you already know more than most people know about addiction, but you're like on this lifelong path of mastery. If you haven't read or listened to mastery by Robert green, please do yourself a favor. Uh, Zach, because I think you'd like that book. Did anyone else out there? That might be a good book for you to mastery. So mastery. Good. I have, I have, uh, I have the, uh, the 48 laws of power. Oh yeah. Um, I, and I've only got about a quarter of the way through that. That's a big one. Yeah. I didn't finish that quite. I finished the art of seduction. Have you read that? No, no. I, it, there, he's an interesting writer, man. It's because it, it's, it's, and I love, I love that kind of stuff. Same way, same way with like Jordan Peterson. It's very, very intellectually yeah. deep, very intellectually deep. I almost feel stupid like reading it. I, 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 I keep, I have to, I, I have to keep my thesaurus open on my phone <laughs> while I'm reading. Like I, I, there's, it's, you know, it's really deep Jordan stuff, Peterson. but, oh yeah. Well, oh, yeah, for sure. Um, um, although beyond order, uh, doesn't seem as intellectually deep as, uh, it was way easier to read than the first one. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So, I mean, but yeah, it, I mean, at this point, and I was just having this conversation uh, earlier today, you know, I've gotten to a place where I've realized that I have to be the best version of myself in order for me to, you know, we were talking about ego and, and status, you know, um, I, at that, you know, back in the bar days and in, in the music scene, I, I thrived on wanting to be this vision or vert, you know, um, I wanted to be quantified by every person around me. I went, I needed to know that they welcomed me and, and that they wanted me there, you know, and, um, and it mattered. It really mattered in my, in my heart. Um, and I don't know why, I don't know why I felt so deeply or so strongly about that because now, now in my life through, through all this pain and, you know, um, the wisdom brought on by the pain. Um, I I've learned that if I can't, if I can't be the best version of myself in my eyes, I will never amount to shit to anyone else. Not, 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 not genuinely superficially, maybe, but not genuinely, because if I can't be the best version of myself to me, how can I be the best version? How can I be the best father I could be? How can I be the best boyfriend or husband? How can I be the best son? You know, how can I be the best employee or, or entrepreneur, or whatever, you know, how can I, how, if I can't be the best version of myself, what can I be to my clients? You know, it's all of that. So I, when, when I, when I, when I finally found my true, my, you know, I, so we talk, you know, in, in, uh, in the recovery hierarchy or the success hierarchy, right? You know, it's, it, you know, spiritual, spiritual is a, is a spiritual awakening is when, is when we, when we're able to identify who we truly are, who, who we are in this giant, you know, universe, we're on, we're on this speck in the whole universe and we're, we're a speck on a speck, you know, and, but, but who are we, who are we, what part do we play in that, in the big picture, you know, um, mm -hmm. because it doesn't come down to whether people, like, it doesn't come down to whether people like us or not. It comes down to, did we do a good job? Did we leave a legacy, you know? And, and um, I, I do just, we like I want to be based on our character. Do we yeah, like ourselves absolutely. based on how we've been rather than what you're saying is rather than do these people like me and, and want me around and love me to, okay, none of that stuff. Of course that still matters, but what do I th really think about myself? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it, it, it really, uh, it changes how you look at things because, because then you stop, you stop making so much time for bullshit. You know, you stop, you, you start learning how to say no more. You start learning how to, um, appropriately place value on, um, 
menial tasks or, or important tasks, you know, you, you would learn how to appropriately value those things, you know, like something that, something that is a non-negotiable, a, a non-negotiable for me is my ability to get to a gym and work out every day. Like it's, it's a non-negotiable, uh, my, my ability to, um, have good food in my house, good whole foods and proper supplementation, you know, far, as far as nutrients and, things like that. You know, I will always put those things first over, you know, over something petty. You know, I would, I would rather make sure I have everything I need here than to, um, blow money somewhere else. You know, it, it's, I, I know that seems, you know, I know we're not talking about money management right now, but like, it's, I, I guess I'm using that as an example. Like it's, it, there's all kinds of things that you start to put in perspective is how do I be the best version of me and, 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 and in a tangible way. You know, and and you have to figure out what what your values are, um, what makes you you, and 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 be able to make those non negotiable, right? And it's and it and it doesn't it doesn't come down to what other people think or how it's going to make somebody else feel. It comes down to it comes down to how do you get from A to B, from from who you are now to the best version of yourself. I love it. This is all such great stuff. And we even love the same authors and many. Did you know that Robert Green mentored Ryan Holiday too? Really? No, I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. Robert Green, the guy that, you know, Art of Seduction, 48 Laws of Power, Mastery, the most recent Laws of Human Nature, which is really good. It's like almost 30 hour audible. I'm not even halfway done. But Ryan Holiday really loved his writing, just loved it. And I think he had probably written maybe one book or something. And he cold, cold emailed him, right? Just reached out to him out of the blue. Didn't know anybody that knew him, but he knew that he wanted Robert Greene to mentor him, you know, at least here and there, help him like, hey, man, I want, I really love the way that you present your books. Like, he just wanted to ask some questions, you know, how do you do this research? What are your systems and processes that you have to create these awesome books? So he started mentoring him and they formed this really tight bond. And that's why Ryan holidays, the ego is the enemy and the obstacle is the way he's yeah. teaching concepts based on lessons from history, from real life examples, world history, American history, 10 years ago, a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago. And that kind of is a fun way to research and put together a book. Uh, but the purpose thing, sure. when people don't have a purpose, well, I think there's a quote in the Bible too, without a purpose, the people perish or something like that. My purpose, and you, you, you touched on it, being the best version of yourself, not just for you, but so you can be good for other people. So you can be like a productive member of your family, your social circle, your, and then hopefully your community in the world at large. And Jordan Peterson's so great at talking about that. Pull as much responsibility as you can and have an aim and go for it. Yeah. It's, just, it's, that's how I felt after I woke up in the hospital and realized that I almost left her without a dad. It was what you're talking about to where I needed to, okay. I was this weak, spineless little guy that, you know, wasn't a, a strong grounded man in any way, shape or form and never had been, never had been ever, you know, and this is what I, here I am 32 at this point. It was a wake up call to where I said, okay, I've been a piece of shit. Look what almost happened. Now I'm alive. So my idea was this little 145 pound at six foot three skinny tweaker, heroin addict, drunk, pill popper that was making decisions for my, that were good for me or I thought were good for me and didn't care how it affected my daughter, my family. And so I wanted to kill or burn off or like sacrifice that archetype, that identity that I had built myself into. And I wanted to basically be the complete opposite of that regarding high distress tolerance Lots of emotional regulation and behavior regulation, tons of purpose and passion and confidence and, you know, just really wanting to help people in life and go after it. And that, you know, the long end of the process was 
now I'm to a place, no mental health issues, no addiction issues. And starting this podcast with Chris a couple of years ago, that's really what sealed the deal for me and gave me way more purpose than before because I never had a, um, a content calendar. There was like no shows. I do articles and videos, you know, sometimes often, sometimes not. But it was kind of just like I did it when I felt like it. So having a twice a week podcast, yeah. that's a lot of responsibility. That's a lot of production. That's a lot of work and organization. So by doing that, it has helped yeah. both Chris and I not only be way more accountable to creating content, but our level of purpose now that so many people are listening to it, telling us that they're really digging it, it's an invaluable resource and people are sharing it. Now the, the amount of purpose just keeps going up because, wow, more and more people are finding Absolutely. it. We're helping more. And it's just like, that's better than any drug high for me. That's better than any alcohol high. Natural high is like uh, physical natural high, emotional, psychological, spiritual, relationship highs. And then mixing mixing them together, like, you know, working out with your girlfriend or something. And while you're kissing, then it's like a intimate high and a physical workout high. Or like what you were saying about achieving goals and picking up responsibilities and, and making progress in these areas of self mastery, dude, that is some cool ass mental or psychological spiritual highs. And that's how yep. we get to rewire our brain where it's got that high dysregulated dopamine set point spot. It's those natural highs that you're talking about, whether they're mental, spiritual, emotional, psychological, physical, or some combination Tantric sex, you know, yoga, breathing exercises, uh, big wave surfing, or just going for a nature walk with my bird or something down the street here by the Famosa Slough. All fun stuff that we can do to first get, get off substances, get through early recovery, and then to just keep like making your baseline of how good and energized you feel just higher and higher and higher. That's a fun goal, man. That's a fun ass goal. I love I love how enlightened you are, man. It's it's uh it's refreshing. I I I will say, man, I I uh you know, I've been on this I've been on this journey to find a new recovery roadmap, you know, for for quite a while and um you know, I've been I've been in outpatient doing drug and alcohol uh, on an outpatient basis uh, for a few years now. And, um, but, I, and, and, and in that time though, in that time, still, still working my own recovery, you know, sometimes, sometimes more successfully than other times, you know, it's sometimes it just felt like you were, a, I, I was, or me, I, sometimes it just really felt like I was in a slump. Um, uh, yeah. and, uh, it was, it was just in the last few years that I discovered, um, how much how much physical uh, regulation uh, played a part in in uh, making or helping me to feel better, you know, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know it was just it was just in the last year that I found fit recovery and um, and in 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 that in that time just learning so so much <laughs> um, and it and, but it, it was inspiring because you know when when I realized when I realized how how crucial the component um, nutrition and exercise was, and also that there's just nobody in my area doing that, not, not geared toward, not geared toward addicts, you know, and, uh, it, it, you know, it's just been, it's just been the last several months that I've really wanted to take bring or bring that element to the community here. But, um, you know, you and you and Chris have been, um, you know, you were talking about, you know, Robert Green mentoring, uh, Ryan Holiday, which, by the way, I think I think that's how I picked up Forty Eight Laws of Power was listening to a Ryan Holiday podcast and him talking about Forty Eight Laws of Power. So it's interesting that he was a mentor uh, to Ryan Holiday. Um, but um, you know, that was the whole way. That was the whole way I reached out to Chris was um, I was looking for my plus because you know Ryan Holiday, Ryan Holiday talks about having you know a plus, minus, and an equal. Um, and what I mean by plus minus equal, if you're not, uh, if you're not hip to it is a plus is someone to learn from your minus is someone you teach 
and your equal is someone you compete against, right? So um, I was looking for a plus. I wanted to get more knowledge and more and more working in, 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 a, in a better working base in um, biochemical restoration and alternative unconventional um, addiction recovery methods, you know, um, because I want to be able to bring this this element um, in a much more tangible way that my community has never seen, you know. So being able to um, share this time with you and Chris on these podcasts and, um, you know, um, Lord knows what's what's going to happen in the future, um, you know, but um, I'm super excited to be um, in your guys' world and, and, and uh, very grateful. I wanted I wanted to be able to tell you that I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to be able to um, be be this close with you guys and have these conversations because it's it's such a it's such a blessing to be able to have these types of experiences. And um, I've just in our podcast today, I've learned I've learned so much uh, about you and myself and. Um, it's just been like, I almost feel like I leveled up my own recovery today. I should hope so, man. Since Chris and I started to do this regularly, I feel like I've worked through all of my fucking life traumas, all my shit. I really do, man. Just talking yeah. about it with not just Chris, but lots of other guests, including like, uh, yeah. my spiritual coach that I worked with before and then her, her coach. So like all these like metaphysical people that are very enlightened light workers and just speak that language and know that about that stuff so well. So just lots of talking, talking, talking in a way where I'm teaching other people, but I'm also learning and I'm helping other people to teach the audience by asking questions and having communication. But I'm dead serious, man. I feel like Chris and I have leveled up our post addiction lives our beliefs our thoughts i mean and like i said worked through a lot of trauma just it's crazy just talking about this stuff in self-compassionate ways that are exploratory you know we've got rapport and a general sense of wanting to learn and help other people man magic happens it's like i i swear i get more out of this than all the people listening to it man it's great i'm never gonna stop and it's great to have you now too, because you know, I forget the quote, but it's hard. I'm not going to try to say it cause I'll butcher it, but yeah. something along the lines of if it was just Chris and I all the time, oh man, people would get so bored of that. I'd get super bored of that. Even when we do three or four in a row, I'm thinking, okay, well, these people are probably getting sick of it. And so <laughs> we love to have, you know, new additions. And I know he's yeah. going to be announcing some really cool stuff about you real soon. And it's just great to have like-minded people. That's when Chris found me, he found me and then he reached out to me to see if I wanted to do a, take a guest blog post from him. It was a great article. And then after that, I was like, man, this guy's awesome. Ever since then, we just hit it off and we've been in contact uh, and then eventually we started Elevation Recovery together, but we were both like our own lone wolf. He was a lone wolf on the East Coast, and I was a lone wolf on the West Coast. He was doing biochemical restoration, blogging, that type of stuff for alcohol. And back then I, I was just doing opioids, opiateaddictionsupport.com, helping people to get off those substances. And then it was great to have somebody to mastermind with and we'd level each other up. There was things that, you know, he was smarter at and vice versa. And then so just growing with him, even long distance, I feel like the amount of progress I've made with with Chris in my life as both a friend, but more importantly, a, a you know business partner, co-host, is I feel like instead of the normal results I would have got without him, and I think this is true for him too. I'm sure he would say, I feel like we are getting multiplied geometrical gains. So it's like, here's my gains without Chris, but with Chris gains in life multiply geometrically, man, it's just crazy. And that's what I feel that you do as well. And you're a lot, you know, you're very, a lot like me regarding 
our past and regarding what substances gave to us. We probably have similar, uh, similar biochemistries uh, pre-using all the drugs and alcohol. But this has been a great session. I don't want to go too much longer because I know people <laughs> hardly ever listen to the really long episodes. They'll be like, hey, can you just do like shorter episodes? I don't got all that time. <laughs> but don't worry. We're making yeah, more clips down a little nowadays. bit. It's fine. Yeah, we're making clips nowadays for people that like to watch <laughs> the shorter ones. It's more fun when you get to go from beginning to end, my opinion. And hey, people, if it's too long, do what I do and listen to it between 1.5 and 2.5 speed or something. Or two, two speed on YouTube, but on Audible, it goes up big time. <laughs> so thanks yeah. so much, my man, Zach. This has been great. Right, uh, what if, if anyone doesn't know, this was Zach and I's first time podcasting together or even talking together that wasn't text. So I already feel like I've known you for so many years, you know? It's going to be, it's going to be, uh, I'm looking forward to spending more time together one of these days. I, I, I know, I know Chris gets out to, gets out there to see, you. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to make a trip out to California that I can actually fucking remember. That'd be cool. <laughs> yeah, do it. He's coming again this fall. No date right picked on. out yet, but he's thinking around September. Beautiful time. Yeah. All the tourists go home at the end of summer vacation. Gorgeous weather. Chris and I have a blast. You got to come. I think eventually we'll do like a cool retreat with all of us, you know, in Tana and whoever yeah. else more we have by then get like a huge Airbnb like mansion or something and just go post up there and have fun and mastermind and shoot videos and podcast lifestyle. Anybody that's thinking they're going to miss out without awesome. alcohol and drugs is sorely mistaken. It, there's a time and a place for that for most people, but really all the good shit in life, the stuff with the meaning and the purpose, the spiritual needs. Once you get rid of the ego and start realizing what's the important shit, it's not drugs and alcohol, at least addiction for most of us. People can use drugs and alcohol, but no one wants to be in a severe addiction to where it's just destroying everything. So yeah. thanks we again, Zach. We crave, connection. we crave connection, man. That's so true. As an introvert, high, uh, super introvert, I still crave connection. And it's a good thing I got this bird and a girlfriend and a kid. Because if I didn't have any of these, you know, when I go out, hang out with other people, yeah, I can have fun and it can be great connection, but I get burned out pretty quick. So I've yeah. got connection, tons of living connection sources in my physical environment. Hey, that's part of the recovery hierarchy. Optimize your physical environment where you live, your community. It all makes sense. It's all together. 